So good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Mustafa. For the ones who don't know me, I'm a PGY4 uh, emergency resident. Today, I'm going to talk about pigtails with the main focus on uh, tips and tricks uh, in terms of uh, how to put the tube in and how should you troubleshoot. So my goals from today is to review the technique for pigtail insertion, discuss tips and tricks for insertion, discuss some complications and troubleshooting. And I'll start with the case and, and, and the, these two cases that I'm going to discuss kind of um, give an idea why I thought of, about this talk. This was uh, when I was in trauma uh, some years ago. We had this uh, lady who was overweight on the floor who had um, rift fractures and was found to have a pneumothorax. So I attempted to put a pigtail tube uh, because it, it was just a pneumothorax, not big. Um, I was go as I was going in, the needle was going in deep and deep and I was asking myself did I go in or not because this is a blind technique I don't want to lacerate the lung and then some blood came on my needle so I thought I'm in I put my uh, my pigtail and uh, did the x-ray afterwards only to find out that my pigtail was in the subcutaneous tissue and the reason I got some blood is the patient had some blood in the subcutaneous tissue secondary to the trauma so how could I have I avoided this problem of course we'll put the chest tube later for this lady my second case is um, a lady that was at the JJH, uh, needed intubation, uh, got intubated, a post uh, intubation x ray showed uh, a pneumothorax. So I went with Lori Robichaud, who put a pigtail. Uh, we high fived ourselves after the x ray, you know, everything went well. And then only nurse to call us later on to have this view. Uh, uh, kind of significant air leak. Uh, it was more than this, it looked like a shisha. So then when this happened, I asked myself, if I have this problem, what should I do? Uh, doing a pigtail is easy. It's fun. It's a straightforward procedure, uh, spending a technique. But when things go the way you don't expect, what should you do? So I went on and read a little bit about the topic. In general, indications for pigtails, as we know, are pneumothorax, pleural effusion, slash empyema, hemothorax. I will not delve much into the ind uh, indications, as this is not the goal of my talk. Contraindications, there are only relative contraindications, which are presence of skin infection over the, uh, the, the, the area where you're going to put the tube, coagulopathy, or large pulmonary blebs or bullae. So before you go in, it's a good idea to know your kit. And this the kit that, that I'm going to present now is the kit what, which we have at the MUHC, but uh, other kits are varied. And uh, knowing the components is good because at the JJH ICU, for example, they don't have the full assembled kit. You have to kind of pick up, pick up your uh, components, which makes it fun, like a kind of a, a Lego puzzle uh, challenge. But knowing your com components is good. So this is the kit that we have at the MUHC. So the components are this needle, which can be short or long, which is the needle you're going to use to get in and then thread your uh, guide wire. You will have a syringe, you will have your short blade, you will have your guide wire, you will have your dilator, and then you have your pigtail. And you have a stiffener for the pigtail. And this is how it looks when you put the stiffener in. It's going to be not straight 100%, but it's not going to be curved. And at the end, when you put your pigtail in, th this is the connector, uh, which in which this part you're going to connect to the chest, uh, to the pleurovac or Hamlic valve. And the other part you're going to connect to your uh, um, uh, uh, your pigtail. After you finish, you have two options to connect. You either have the pleurovac or a Hamlic valve. Hamlic valve for the ones who didn't see it before, it's a one-way valve that directs air or fluid to go out from this direction to this direction. So it has this membrane that will allow air or fluid to pass from one area to the other. And it's very easy to know because if you guys can see from the picture, there is an arrow saying that you have to go in this direction. And this is quite important because if you connect your tube the other way around, you will allow air to go in and not out and you may cause an tension pneumothorax. And I actually have seen this on one of the floors. The patient did not have tension pneumothorax, but the, the, the tube was connected in the wrong way. Pleurovac, we always use it. Uh, so I think it's useful to discuss this anatomy. The most important part of the pleurovac is the water seal chamber. This one, the one in the middle. And the idea of the water seal chamber, it's similar to when we were kids, and or maybe until now, 
when you have a straw and you have some water or Pepsi or whatever, and you want to drink fluid, when you pull, you can only pull fluid, not gas. But when you push, you can push the gas. So it's a one-way valve, basically. The air comes from the collection chamber, and here which we collect the fluid, goes and dissolves in this uh, uh, water seal chamber, but can never go back. So it's a one-way valve. So we have the collection chamber, the water seal chamber, and we have the suction regulation chamber. This chamber, if we connect it to the wall suction, we can regulate how much negative pressure we apply. If we have significant air leak, if we have um, a significant amount of fluid or thick fluid that we need more negative suction to be applied. So this is kind of just a, a GIF image to demonstrate the concept. So you have the collection chamber, fluid will go in. At the same time, gas will go in from the patient, migrate up, go to the water seal chamber, dissolve, will never come back. And then if you want to apply some suction, you can apply it from here. We always have seen this dial at the, at the, 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 the Plurivac. This dial controls the amount of suction you have. So if it's at minus 20, it doesn't matter how much water uh, wall suction you're applying. If it's minus 80, minus 100, the amount of suction you're gonna get is 80. Uh, from uh, is 20, sorry, minus 20, since it's on 20. If you want to have more suction, for example, you're connecting two or more chest tubes, you have significant air leak, you can increase your suction power. Does the size of the tube matter? It does. So in general, if you are removing air or serous fluid, that's clear, you can go between size 8 and, and, uh, and 14. And as far as I remember, 14 measurement is uh, three divided by one. That's what I, I remember. So the higher number, you know, the larger the size of the tube. If you have pass, what they say in up to date, they recommend 24 to 32. But as I was preparing with this talk, I reviewed with one of my uh, risk fellow colleague, colleagues, he told me sometimes they use 14. And the reason is um, the larger the size of the tube, the less comfortable is it, it is for the patient. So they use the smaller size, 14, realizing that it needs more irrigation to prevent it from blocking. Blood in general, you need large tube, 24 to 36. Uh, in general, in, in blood, we use chest tube, not a big tail. So before you go in, we'll talk about patient positioning. So in general, there are three positionings. The first position, which is not shown here, because I uh, I didn't use it before and we don't use it often, so I I, I wasn't comfortable discussing it, is the, uh, the anterior to the chest wall, secondary space, mid-calvicular line. You see sometimes people from um, um, uh, interventional radiology use it. The second position that we use often for uh, chest tube insertion, for uh, pectal uh, blind insertion, is, is uh, the lateral uh, position. And I'm going to talk more about it when I discuss the technique. And the third position is going from the back. So a little bit about going from the back. Usually uh, I, we use it if we want to remove fluid, not to put the big tail. If the patient has some uh, pleural effusion, we need to drain only once. We don't want to leave the tube and we go in that, uh, in that position. And the reason of going in that position is, as you see from this graph, the lung and the pleura kind of end more inferior on post posteriorly as opposed to anteriorly. Here, as you can see, um, anteriorly, the pleura ends at the 10th uh, uh, costal cartilage, while it ends at the 12th rib posteriorly. So you have more room to drain the fluid. So I, as you go in, you're going to position the patient uh, uh, with their hands on a table and a little bit flexed so, so you can open the rib space. I would use ultrasound if you want to drain fluid from the back to, to go as high as you can because you don't want to go into the diaphragm because the, the, you know, the diaphragm moves with respiration. Um, if, it's, if you're going only once, usually you would use an angiocath, not a pigtail, and you would connect uh, your angiocath to the cyst collecting chamber, the same one we use when we uh, drain acidic fluid. This graph is just to demonstrate that the intercostal artery uh, you got, all of you us know that when we go, we go above the rib to avoid injuring the van, the intercostal artery. But more medially, the costa, intercostal artery is a bit more prominent than laterally. So it is recommended that you go uh, a bit more laterally than medially, afra being afraid of the risk that you may injure the artery if you go medially, even if, it's, if you go above the rib. 
So should you use or not use ultrasound? I find, I, I think you should use ultrasound always if you're draining fluid for air. I think you can escape with not uh, draining it. Usually you'll have a large pocket of air, you can go blindly. Ultrasound helps you to estimate the depth of the needle. Remember, this is a blind technique. See your needle as you go in, if you do it ultrasound um, um, uh, assisted, uh, not so ultrasound, with ultrasound in leaf, uh, real life, as opposed to just uh, using ultrasound to help you to know exactly where you go. Really consider it if you have an obese patient, if you drain fluid close to the diaphragm, if you need to draw it, uh, drain it close to the diaphragm, or if you're draining loculated fluid. So again, don't forget this is a blind procedure. So what I should have done with that lady is estimate my depth before I go in. So you can use four methods to estimate how deep you can go. You can use the x-ray, just use the x-ray and measure how deep you think you can go or you need to go. If you, have a, if you had a CT scan, use the CT scan. If you have ultrasound, use the ultrasound, don't go, don't go blind. Even when you, when you go in, if you're go, go, going in blind, pay attention how deep the needle goes in when you hit the rib. We're gonna discuss this, but initially you're gonna go in and anesthetize the skin and the rib. So as you go in, have a mental image of how far you went in. So when you go in with the second needle, the one that you're gonna thread with, you kind of have a mental image, how deep you need to go. If you have multiple scars in a patient that had surgeries before, had multiple chest, uh, pigtails or chest tubes before in the past, and you really have to put the tube in, you may consider putting a chest tube on the side next to you, because if you injure one of the adhesions, they cause significant bleeding, you may have to put a chest tube to optimize your drain. So just consider having a chest tube on the side. Do you guys think this is a pneumothorax or not? I'll leave you for two seconds to look at the x-ray. So actually, this is not a pneumothorax. This is a large subpleural blip. And you, you classically see this with COPD patients. It's a rare thing. I never seen it before. Even when I asked around uh, the people who have experience, they have seen it once or twice. But it's a thing to consider. If you look in the literature, there are case reports of people that come with COPD exacerbation. So they are in respiratory distress. You do the x-ray, you look at this and you're like, my God, this is a pneumothorax. Let me put in the pigtail or chest tube. And then you put it in a new uh, um, rupture, uh, the, the subleural plate causing a, uh, a large uh, pneumothorax, a large air leak, making things worse. So if you see this, so look at the x-ray. One of the guys is usually if you have a pneumothorax, the pneumothorax will be the whole uh, 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 chest, not going inferiorly. This one kind of have a, a crescent uh, a morphology going kind of uh, this way. Um, look, if, if, if it takes with you, if you have a COPD patient, it would be helpful to see a previous x-ray and compare. If this, the patient had it before, then likely this is not a pneumothorax, likely this is a large subpleural blip. Should you use ultrasound? We, we love to use ultrasound to diagnose pneumothoraxes. If there is sliding, then this is not a pneumothorax. But if there is no sliding, this does not rule out a pneumothorax, does not rule out, rule in, sorry, a pneumothorax, because these patients can have adhesions, and the adhesions will prevent the, the lung from moving with the pleura. So be, be extra careful, maybe ask for an expert, and the, the optimum way to diagnose it is with, with the CT scan. Again, this is rare, but just keep it in mind not to uh, fall into a pitfall. So going into the procedure, before you go, have consent from the patient, Mark where you think you need to go uh, if you are using ultrasound, uh, not in real life. And remember, this is a ster sterile procedure. So talking about the lateral approach, anatomically, you you're going in the triangle of safety if you're going blindly, not with the ultrasound. So lateral to the pec major, anterior to the lat dorsae, and beneath uh, the axilla. When you put your drapes, I would recommend, if you're doing, doing it with the male, to keep the nipple in your uh, field of vision. So when you put your covers, just keep the nipple. So if, if you lose your track, your anatomy, at least you can use the nipple as, as, as a landmark. If it's a lady, you can use the breast fold as your mark. And then, and then as you go in, remember the van. So 
your first step is to give anesthesia. You're going in with a uh, lidocaine, with epinephrine, 1%. You'll start with the skin, and then you will go and anesthetize the rib. And this is the step where you're gonna estimate your rib, have a mental image of it. And then you're gonna migrate slowly upwards. And as you migrate, you're gonna pull. You migrate, you're gonna pull. And then you're gonna go in inside you puncture until you puncture the pleura. And with you going in and pulling, you're gonna get one of two things. Either you're gonna get air or you're gonna get the fluid. And then you're gonna know you're in. As soon as you get in, don't push anymore. You don't wanna go in and injure the lung. Um, uh, as I was preparing this talk, one of my colleagues told me uh, he had a colleague who went through the, the pleura with ultrasound. He was seeing his ultrasound needle, but he did not stop. So he punctured the diaphragm and punctured the spleen. And then he put the tube in the spleen, apparently. So even if you go in, don't go, don't go in deeper. Remember, this is a blind technique. One other thing I like to do is I keep in my needle this one when I inject, and even the second one, which I'm going to uh, show soon, I keep some fluid inside it, either lidocaine or saline. It's much easier to see the air or the fluid if your needle has some uh, fluid in it. So you anesthetize the skin, you go in with your large needle, you put it in the pleural space. Once you do this, you're going to thread your guide wire. Once you're done with threading your guide wire, you're going to remove your needle, you're going to do your skin incision, and then you're going to guide in your dilator, kind of similar to when we put the center line. After that, you're going to put the stiffener on your uh, pigtail. You're going to direct your pigtail downwards with the curve if you're uh, targeting fluid, upwards if you're targeting air. And as you go in, if you, um, after um, a few dots, as you see these dots, after passing the first or second dot, I would recommend that you remove the stiffener because the stiffener makes the, the, the guide, the uh, the pigtail hard, you don't want to go in and injure the lung again or injure any structure. Remove it, make the, 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 the pigtail less stiff, and then push the pigtail until you cover all the dots. When you finish from this, you can connect your pigtail to the connector and then connect to the, uh, to the uh, to Plurvac or uh, Heinrich valve. Once you finish, you need to fix your tube. Uh, at some places like the Georgian General Hospital, they have a sticker that you can put and fix the tube in, similar to what the radiology use, or you can do, just go classic. It's very easy and simple. You just put one stitch uh, to connect the skin, you put your knot, and then each limb, you, you, you um, make it around the pigtail two or three times. And then after that, you just tie your loop. And that's it, you're finished. I would recommend making a snug uh, tie because you don't want the tube to slide in, but not too snug to uh, obstruct the tube. Use something that non-absorbable and some something that braided. So you want something that braided because you don't want the tube to slide, you know, to kind of open, and you want something that non-absorbable like silk because if the patient stays with the tube for a longer time, you don't want it to dissolve. Ultrasound, you can use it for multiple uh, indications, as we discussed. You can use it before going in to know exactly where you're going to go in, and then just you just mark it. Or you can use it in real, uh, real lifetime, similar to what we do with the central line. I have used um, cardiac probe before. I find it's easier to go above the rib. But um, once um, I had an obese patient, I used the abdominal probe, uh, and, and it's the same. You can just use it, and uh, you see your needle as you go in. So after you connected your tube, uh, yeah, you think it's in the right position. Should you connect to a Plurivac or a Hamlic valve? I would say the answer is simple. If you are dealing with someone who has a primary spontaneous pneumothorax, who is stable, who is healthy, I think a Hamlic valve uh, is, a wise, uh, is a reasonable option. Because you know, most likely this patient doesn't have a large air leak. Maybe you guys are aware of the study, the large study that was a New England Journal of Medicine that even discussed uh, why do I put uh, a pig tail to begin with to, for these patients. So most likely these patients are going to do fine. You can put a Hamlic valve for them, do an x-ray. If there is re-expansion, even not for the expansion of the lung, you know they're going to do fine, you can discharge them. Otherwise, if the patient is going to be admitted, if the patient has large hydropneumothorax, if the patient has traumatic pneumothorax because the pathophysiology is different, here there is a laceration of the lung, if you're dealing with blood or any other six secretions, Plurivac may be a wiser option. After you put your tube in, you need to know that you are in the right place. So how do you know that you are in the right place? Yeah, you have multiple methods to know. 
One is if you say you see a leak, so most likely you are in the right position. The other thing is if you see oscillation of the pigtail, if you put a, a, a Heimlich valve, ask the patient to cough. When they cough, you 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 will see oscillation of the uh, of the tube. The other way to use it with with the Heimlich valve, if you are really nerdy and want to be sure, if the patient has an air leak, you can put the other end of the Heimlich valve in a cup of water and ask him to cough. And then if you see air bubbles, then you know that you're in the right place. But of course, you need an X-ray to see if you have full expansion of the lung and you see the position of the big tail catheter just to be sure you're not in the heart or any other uh, uh, important organ. So I put my, uh, my, my uh, I connected my uh, pleurovac. Should I connect to suction or not? Again, it goes to, into the same uh, question. Do you think you're dealing with a significant uh, air leak or not? So primary spontaneous pneumothorax, most likely you, you don't need the suction. The patient is going to re-expand. But traumatic pneumothorax, if you have a large air leak, like the first case I have shown, if there, you think there is impediment of drainage or pleural effusion, you have drainage, but you think it's not enough, you want to increase the drainage. Or if you have hemothorax, then yeah, maybe you should connect the suction. Going to complications. So there are many complications that can happen. The most common of which is tube malposition. And it's an umbrella term that means the tube is not the right, in the right place. It's not in the pleura. It's in the lungs, it's in the heart, it's in the liver, uh, whatever. It's the most common complication. Uh, think about it as a penetrating trauma. So God forbid you're on the spleen, you are in a vital organ, call the surgeon, uh, do the ABCs with the patient. But most commonly, it goes into the lung parenchyma or it can be interfissural. If it goes to the lung parenchyma, most commonly you will not know the patient can be asymptomatic or you may have inefficient drainage. The patient may cough up blood. The patient may have persistent or even massive air leak. The difference is massive air leak will have very huge significant air leak. The patient may be unstable. You may need uh, to intubate even the patient. But this is a, like an extreme scenario. CT scan is the best option uh, to show that the tube is in interoperanchymal position. If you have it in interoperanchymal position, don't remove the tube because if you remove it, you may uh, cause a significant pneumothorax and the patient may go into tension pneumothorax. Put another tube, secure it, be sure it's in the right position, working, then you can remove this tube. And it's, it's wise to let a surgeon know or just let the thoracics or uh, trauma know about the patient. When it's in, infrafissural, it's going to go on in one of the fissures of the lung and, uh, and the, the, the tube may not work well. And the way you know that it's not working well, one, uh, the, the, uh, the fusion will not be draining as much or there will be much, much drainage from the, uh, the, the lung will not be very, uh, uh, not expanding. If you look at the uh, oscillation of the pleurovac, you will not see much oscillation. Uh, if you do, uh, the best way to know is to do CT scan, uh, or even with the X-ray, you will see your tube in the kind of in the middle in the lung, and you will see that you don't have much much oscillation. If you still have a pneumothorax, you think you still need the tube to be functional. What you should do is just draw the tube back for a few centimeters. Use X-ray to estimate how far you need to go back. Bleeding is the nightmare for anyone, uh, surgeons or adults. If you have bleeding, it has, can be uh, multiple causes. One is just draining hemothorax, you're draining a hemothorax. Or you could have injured intercostal vessel or major vessel, God forbid. If this happens, do the ABCs. Monitor the hemodynamics of, and the chest tube output. Obtain serial x-rays. If you think you have significant bleeds, do a type and screen. If the output is more than 200 milliliters per hour for the three hours or 1.5 liters uh, uh, and the patient or the patient is unstable, then emergent uh, thorato thoracotomy uh, is probably indicated. You need to call the surgeon. So it's, uh, it goes back to the amount of bleed. S small bleed, not very significant, maybe can observe more than that, call the surgeon very deep. The expansion pulmonary edema is a rare complication associated with the removal of large volume of air or, uh, or fluid. Um, ignore this. I don't think it can happen up to three days post insertion tube, usually it's within 24 hours. It's rare for um, uh, removal of uh, uh, fluid, less than 1%. For air, I have read between 24 to 34%. The patient will present with difficulty with breathing, cough, they may need oxygen. If you do the x ray, 
you'll see um, edema on only one part of the lung. And treatment is supportive. The best way to, pro uh, to avoid it is to prevent it. Uh, if you are draining of, um, a large pleural effusion, uh, what is recommended is to drain 1.5 liter in the first hour and then, uh, sorry, 1.5 liter, clamp for one hour and then uh, open again and drain more. Infection, you will have it if you have the tube for a long time. Uh, usually, we will not see it and emerge. It's going to be seen more for people who follow the, the patient. So for some troubleshooting, if the tube got disconnected, the first thing you should do is clamp the tube because air then will go freely inside. Uh, the patient may cause a pneumothorax. Clean the tube with antiseptic and bring a new suction apparatus to connect it and then do an x-ray to be sure that you don't have significant pneumothorax. If you have a persistent air leak, like the case I had, I want you guys to look here. Um, the manufacturer tries to quantify, uh, quantify the amount of air leak. The uh, so you could see the more uh, of, of um, dials move, the more significant air leak you may have. So if you have an air leak, I think that uh, based on what I understood, the best, uh, sorry, the first uh, step that you should do is to identify if the leak is coming from inside the patient or from the connection apparatus. And the way to know is to bring a clamp, clamp the tube, Next to, next to the skin to the patient. Just be sure that they don't have a pneumothorax uh, or uh, if they have a pneumothorax, don't do it for a long time, not to cause attention pneumothorax. If you clamp it next to the skin of the patient and the bubbling continues, then most likely you are dealing with leaking from the connection tube. Then just migrate laterally until you find, until the, the leakage stops and then you'll know that your leakage is just immediately above the point where you, uh, you, you clamped then you either can change your tube depending on where the leakage is from or change your connecting apparatus. But now you connect it next to the skin and the leakage stopped, then the leakage is likely from the patient. So it's either from the lung or it's from, um, um, uh, from, uh, from the esophagus. You, if you don't think there is a reason for the patient to have injury of the esophagus and likely it's from the bronchial tree or from the lung, what you should do is do an X-ray be sure that uh, the lung is fully expanded. You can apply suction to help it to be uh, full re-expansion. Consider uh, asking the help of a surgeon or uh, um, a traumatologist that just because they need to follow the patient. In most cases, if they're not massive air leaks, if they're significant air leak, will uh, close uh, within three to four days of conservative management. If they don't close, then thoracic surgeons have their own tricks to deal with that. When to remove the tube, if first the x-ray shows no, uh, is normal, there is no uh, uh, significant air leak, uh, sorry, there is full expansion of the lung. Assess for air leak, uh, so with the pleurvac, you will ask the patient to cough. If you have uh, air leak here, then uh, you have air leak. If you remove the tube, likely you're going to have recombination of just uh, of, of pneumothorax. If you have a hamlic valve, just put the hamlic valve in a cup of water, ask the patient to cough, no bubbling, then there is no leak, then you can remove the tube. And the way to remove the tube, you don't want to remove the tube and uh, cause the pneumothorax at the same time. So you will ask the patient to take a deep breath and keep it in. When the patient keep it in, you'll have some distance for yourself. If you remove it and you take time or cause pain, what the patient is gonna do is gonna say, ah, so they're gonna expire. They're not gonna inspire. Um, so as soon as you move the tube, you're going to seal it with Vaseline gauze because it, uh, if you just put a normal gauze, uh, air may come and leak in. Remember some pigtails may have wires around them. I don't know if you have seen uh, the pigtails inserted by intervention in radiology. They have small wires around them. And the way to see them, just go toward the connection is open it. You'll see a wire that's kind of curved around. Just uh, undo the wire. If we don't do that, the pigtail will be curved and you know what we can cause for the patient and this happened with me before with a young guy who who got uh, mad because I, I didn't pay attention and when i was preparing this i was discussing with one of my um, thoracic surgeon uh, colleagues and he recommended that i include this so it's when to refer for a thoracic surgeon post pneumothorax uh, basically uh, any indication except if it's a primary pneumothorax first time I would argue maybe many of us will feel uncomfortable for that indication. We will we'll consult a thoracic surgery regardless. So the take-home points is to review the technique of setting the big tail, 
Again, remember, this is a blind procedure. So use the techniques that we discussed. Not every procedure goes forward. Uh, so know that it's, it's the complications and how to manage them. And at the end, uh, special thanks to Dr. John Nemeth, Yassin Lawati, and Amra Lokil for giving me uh, some advice about, around the topic. Thank you.